what makes a river a river. If you stop and look, it's pretty obvious. Flowing water. Without fresh flowing water, a river simply ceases to be. Small streams feed into creeks which join our rivers. Ultimately, they flow to the coast to rejuvenate and sustain the bays. These in-stream flows form the most elemental foundation for fish and wildlife. In-stream flows are really just the volume, the timing, and the frequency of water flowing in a river or a stream. A related term is freshwater inflows, which refers to fresh water flowing into a bay and estuary system. And that is another form of what we call environmental flows. Collectively, we refer to in-stream flows and freshwater inflows as environmental flows. In-stream flows, for example, basically provide the habitat for fish and wildlife, the fish that live in the stream and the wildlife that inhabits the area adjacent to the stream. It's also important to note that in-stream flows are really critical to maintaining good water quality. Creeks and rivers are not only an important source of surface water, they also play a vital role in providing fresh water to underground aquifers. Aquifers get recharged primarily in a couple of ways. One is by the direct infiltration of rainfall on the ground as water soaks through the soils and gets into the unsaturated zone of these aquifers. But the creek beds themselves provide the bulk of the water getting into these aquifers. The caves and sinkholes exposed in the creek bed to these aquifers act like big bathtub drains and drain huge amounts of water out of these surface creeks and pour that water straight into the aquifer. So having base flow or in-stream flows into these creeks and rivers is extremely important for some of these aquifers. Biologists keep a close eye on these caves. If one gets clogged when flows are up, it's time to get down to some hands-on aquifer management. Sometimes if there's a lot of debris on it or the water's kind of deep, we actually will get in the water with a mask and snorkel and start pulling the sticks and leaves off the grate. And it's pretty dramatic. Sometimes if you just get the right stick off, all of a sudden water just starts sucking into the feature. You can feel it. Wait until we get really fat is amazing. But then as all that water starts pouring in, it displaces all the air that's accumulated in the cavern. And Lo and behold, it looks like a geyser in the creek bed. It's pretty exciting to see. The need to understand the dynamics of these flows becomes more important as demands increase on water resources. In 2001, the Texas legislature passed Senate Bill 2. Part of this bill directed three state agencies to collaborate on a comprehensive study of river flows. The Texas In-Stream Flow Program is an interagency effort. We have some partner agencies, it's Parks and Wildlife, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and the Texas Water Development Board. We are charged with determining flow conditions necessary to maintain a sound ecological environment in Texas rivers and streams. And we selected five river basins to begin with. Those include the Sabine River, downstream of Toledo Bend Reservoir, the Middle Trinity between Dallas and Lake Livingston, the Brazos River basically downstream of Waco, and then the Lower San Antonio, and also the Guadalupe River downstream of Canyon Lake. Out on the river, the agencies team up with local river authorities to conduct an array of samplings and tests. We'll take measurements at different flow rates. Well, the water board, um, our specialty is the hydrology and the hydraulics. And so we do have the equipment for the, the ADCP like this for taking the velocity and depth measurements. So that's a good uh, division of the labor. I've got a water quality probe. It's got some different components on it. You put it in the water and it takes a series of measurements. So for example, dissolved oxygen, which is really important to the fish. Other types of measurements like the pH of the water, the temperature of the water the conductivity of the water. 
Parks and Wildlife's primary role is to collect biological data, including fish sampling. We may do some collections of the invertebrates or bugs that live in the river. We're very interested in the status of the mussel populations because they're directly tied to the level of water in the river. Another important aspect of the study seeks to incorporate local knowledge and values to solicit public input the team conducts stakeholder meetings and work groups involving citizens within each river basin. And I would like to get more access to the river. That way you can get more interest. You may get more funding for the river. The water was five foot deep there. And I remember as a small kid, it was 18, 20 foot deep at times. So I don't know what you could do to get more water into it to bring the beauty back. Well, I'm 86 years old. I've been there, I know. Oh, it's, it's changed around, but it was beautiful here when I was a kid, 16, 17 years old, it was clear as it could be, you could see the bottom of it, you can't do it now, and, and the river ain't as big as it used to be, not less water, but I think it's the foundation of the whole country, a lot of people, it's the only water they had is on the river when it first began. It means a whole lot to those people that still does. The input that we get from stakeholders and the public will be used to help guide us in our study design. We want to make sure that in our studies, to the extent that we can, we can address the values that the public and the stakeholders find important. Being able to, to rub shoulders with the kind of expertise that you find in Parks and Wildlife and the Water Board, and, and there's some people that show up at these meetings that are well worth spending time with, even if you have to deal with the topics that the little work groups go off into. Maybe there'll be something more out of these groups as we go along. I suspect not, to tell you the truth. I think that they have a quota of stakeholder involvement that they have to deliver for their program to meet their mandate from the state, and they're accomplishing that now. But maybe it'll go on from there, and maybe I will become engaged in, in the river on a, on a continual basis and intend to be one way or another. From now on, that's why I'm involved. I, I want to be involved in the river. You don't have to be on a stakeholder work group to become involved in Texas rivers. Involvement takes on many forms. One way is to simply get out on a river. More and more Texans are doing just that, and more Texas paddling trails are opening up. The paddling trails program started in the mid 90s when Texas Parks and Wildlife started seven coastal paddling trails. Two years ago, Texas Parks and Wildlife started doing some inland paddling trails, so we are now up to 14 paddling trails statewide, with three more scheduled to launch by the end of 2008. Although the department has worked with uh, landowners and communities to open 14 of these, this is the first urban trail and the first one on a lake. So we're very happy to get something in a large urban area like Dallas-Fort Worth where we have the opportunity to promote this type of recreation for families and we hope that other communities, large communities, will follow and we anticipate that they will. As more people experience a paddling trail and gain an appreciation of being out on the water, they may also gain an awareness of what water is worth. I don't think people appreciate water because they turn on their faucets and get a drink or cook with. When you're on the water and you understand that's a, a resource that's not guaranteed to be there forever, then you start thinking about how you can help conserve the water resource. And uh, I think, again, people will understand the significance of that when they get out there and start having fun.